All right, it's time right now for, now we have speakers that are going to be coming up after our keynote. Um, but we wanted to get our keynote in at the, the mid-peak part of the day here. And he's got a great speech. And he is, uh, you know, you start writing a speech and it's never done. I've rewritten it three times already this morning. And I just rewrote it again in my mind because I see this gentleman here with the flag. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is the expression of liberty. Because look how joyous this man is. That's liberty. I've got a couple of housekeeping items that, that I need to get out of the way before I begin the official speech. And the first is to let you know that I brought a case, uh, I smuggled a case in of high capacity magazines. Yeah. Okay. Unfortunately, I, I don't have enough to share with everyone, but if you come see me afterwards, I've got a few, and, and you have to be force multipliers though, and you have to agree that you'll share it with other people. What I have is I have a copy of Concealed Carry Magazine. This has at the very last uh, page, my review of a book by my friends Mark Walters and Rob Pincus, Lessons from Unarmed America. Wonderful book. I gave it a total thumbs up. That's my policy. I never give bad reviews because it's not my place to rain on anybody's parade. If I don't like it, I just keep my mouth shut about it. This was a great book. And I'm going to be discussing today's rally tomorrow night on the nationally syndicated Armed American radio program with Mark Walters. And I look forward to giving them a wonderful report about how great this crowd is. And the other magazine that I brought is Guns Magazine, which I'm the field editor. I do their Rights Watch column every month. And this happens to be the one where I have written about what's going on in Connecticut. And again, I, I wish that I had enough to share with everyone here. I don't. I actually promised these as props to a young man I met up here. I don't see him right now, but I'll give it to him afterwards. There's uh, a bit of sad news that I learned, and that was the passing of Otis McDonald, a giant in Second Amendment. This was the man whose lawsuit in the city of Chicago codified once and for all at the Supreme Court level that the Second Amendment, no, it just doesn't apply to the federal government. It applies everywhere. It's the supreme law of the land, and Chicago has to obey it, just as everyone else does. I have a, a personal anecdote about Mr. McDonald. I met him a couple of years ago in Chicago at the Gun Rights Policy Conference that the Second Amendment Foundation puts up, and I told him at the time how honored I was to meet him, and I said, you know what, in my entire life, I've asked two people for their autographs. One, I was 10 years old, and it was Clayton Moore. Those of you who aren't old enough won't remember Clayton Moore. Those of you who do, the Lone Ranger. Okay, my boyhood hero, I met the guy, I got his autograph. I had never asked anyone for an autograph since then until I met Mr. McDonald. And we were standing in the middle of a hotel lobby. There was no real desk to write on, so Alan Corwin of Nun Laws actually graciously lent his back as the writing surface desk, and I've got a picture of that, and I've got Mr. McDonald's autograph, and it's something that I will treasure, and it's very, very sad news about his passing. This was a champion, and I, I think that we all just need to take a second in our hearts to remember the passing of a man who did a lot, and that we owe a lot, that we'll never be able to pay back, but we have to just be able to remember him in our hearts with gratitude. Now, one other thing. I noticed that there are some people walking around bearing arms today. And I also noticed this, that some people are, are nervous by that. I don't get it. Because to me, it doesn't matter whether you're wearing a firearm or a badge or a uniform or without. Okay, it's how the person behaves. So, thank you for all who show up and give us the example of bearing arms because it's more than just keep them. Yeah. I'd like to tell you what an honor it is to have been asked to address this gathering today. It truly is humbling. Okay, and it's 
humbling to be in front of all of you, and in spite of all the insults, I, I've read in the media some people have called us all some rather uh, insulting names, and that doesn't bother me none. And I'd also ask you, before I get started in earnest, please bear with me. I am recovering from encounters with my own mortality, so if I have to struggle, struggle with my voice, or if I have to take a sip of water, just please bear with me, and we will get through this. Okay, when, when Scott Wilson announced my participation a few months back on Facebook, it was pretty funny. He asked people, guess who the guest speaker is going to be? And what he got back was, Ted Nugent? <laughs> Tom Selleck? And people kept making guesses, and finally Scott goes on, no, it's David Codria. And, and what he got back was, who? <laughs> yeah, really. Because it's true, I'm not a name like that, I'm not a rock and roll legend, I'm not a movie or a TV personality. What I am, is I'm one of you. And I'm one of you who found his voice. And that voice, first and foremost, has been committed to spreading one message. I will not obey orders for Americans to surrender their arms. I will not obey. That's it. My position is personal, and it couldn't be simpler. You bet it's personal, because I'm the one who will pay the price for what I will and what I won't do. The Yankees, they can debate this all they want. To me, it's not debatable. They can pass whatever edicts they like, and I'll, I'll oppose them, and I'll fight them. Ultimately, my choice is that I'll not obey them. And I'm done backing up and compromising. Okay. It may seem funny asking some guy from Ohio, you know, I, I heard they were asking who's here from the various states, and I'm here from Ohio, and it may seem funny asking me to come and address a rally in Connecticut. Uh, I would like to share, I do have a connection. The part of the state I live in is called the Western Reserve. And that was once the portion of land claimed by the colony of and later by the state of Connecticut. And as a matter of fact, my neighborhood in Hudson is called the Connecticut Colony. And the entire area is rich in history, including in the struggle against human slavery, which is really what those claiming the power to control you and dispose of you is all about. I live just around the corner from John Brown's old tannery farm. And say what you will about the man's tactics and his legacy, it does show that some conditions demand defiance if no other means exist. And that, of course, was the situation that led to the original War of the Rebellion against the King. People would not put up with what they came to view as the intolerable acts. Oh, they did for a while, until the damn fools came for the guns. Note that I did not call it the Revolutionary War, because the true revolution was ideological. The realization that free men don't need rulers, that the function of government is to secure the blessings of liberty, and that we, each of us, have certain unalienable rights endowed by our Creator, rights which cannot be legitimately taken away from us by a tyranny of the majority, as now exists in some areas that identify themselves by that most Orwellian of terms, progressive. And you know, war is peace, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength. I have a saying I use on my blog, the War on Guns Notes from the Resistance, that I've yet to see refuted. With progressives, every day is opposite day. Because what's progressive about telling others who are harming no one what they must and must not do, and what they can and cannot have? What's progressive about creating a whole new class of criminals, and I have that word in quotation marks, for refusing to obey edicts founded in ignorance, prejudice, and the desire to rule others. I wrote an article for Guns Magazine recently, that's, that's the one in this issue here, in the Rights Watch column, and I titled it The Unconstitutional State. It's obviously a play on Connecticut's nickname. It started out referring to a line that you folks here are more than familiar with, the one in front of the Department of Emergency Services and Public Protection Building, 
where gun owners came on the last day of 2013 to register their guns and magazines with the DESS Parados in order to comply with the perversely named Gun Violence Prevention and Child Safety Act. Making them do that, that was an intentional indignity. And that such legislation would do nothing to advance its stated purpose and would instead make things less safe for the law abiding, that did not matter to those imposing their will. That was just another oxymoron that calculating minds right here in Hartford no doubt took additional pleasure in. Progressives, opposite, remember? The vocal reaction now, this is, this is the thing. Now we've talked about the gun owners from other states. And you folks experienced the brunt of it. And it actually horrified me. Because some of them was unsympathetic. They did not have to face the terrible choice that you do here. And there were accusations. There were people throwing around words like cowardice. And this was coming from internet commentators post posting up screen names. And isn't that telling? And that making such charges and never, they, they've never been put to the test themselves, and that seemed lost on the most aggressive, that is the most ignorant, the judgmental among them. And as an aside, I'd like to share something with you, that even though I'm an outsider, I can tell you that I know what it's like to be put to that test. Because I was living in California when they passed a law requiring us to register our assault weapons. Okay? And I went to a meeting where the California Department of Justice distributed the registration cards. They told us that we had to fill out, and they used the keyword submit. That is, basically, it was a meeting where they dictated to us the terms of our surrender. Okay, well, I went with two of my friends, the fellow troublemakers, and in front of hundreds, we tore up the damn card and told them in no uncertain terms that would be the only one they got from us. Now, we did it. We did it knowing full well we were putting ourselves out there for scrutiny and more. And I'll never forget this one woman. And I promised my wife, I had this written into the speech. She goes, oh, please, in front of all those people, don't call her a cut and chew or something. Okay, honey, I won't. Okay. But she, she calls out, sir, they don't speak for us. And I thought, you know, yeah, I sure don't, lady. Remember I told you at the beginning, I speak only for me. Anyway, if you'd like to learn more about that, if you do a search on my name along with the professional face of evil, uh, you'll get the details on that little encounter if you're interested in learning more. But it struck me then, it strikes me now, it's a hell of a choice to force a person to make. But back to some of these finger pointers who, who don't understand, who haven't been put to the test. If one is to be blamed, blame on anyone outside of the evil citizen disarmament demanders, and what a word that is that the Bloomberg people use, and their useful idiot enablers, many gun owners would do well to look at the direction of three of their fingers whenever they point one at others. Because after all, how many of them have filled out Form 4473s or applied for permits to carry their guns? And truthfully, in, in light of shall not be infringed, those are acts of, of compromise and surrender. It just, it just, it is. So for them to be pointing the finger at you is absolutely wrong. But now what I'd like to do is I'd like to give you a practical example of something that I call profiles in apathy. I came up with that term years ago after watching worthy project after worthy project fall by the wayside due to lack of gun owner involvement. And I want to tell you why I think it's every bit the enemy that the most committed of gun drivers are. Where's Lenny Benedetto? Is Lenny around? Right there. Okay, yeah, Len Lenny, founding member of the Connecticut Citizens Defense League, the folks that are responsible for bringing us all here today. They're the state's largest grassroots gun rights group. And as you know, they're, they're leading in a lawsuit along with that NRA that challenges the law, but I don't need to tell anyone here that, because we all know. Anyway, Lenny spent several hours that morning passing out CCDL cards and talking to those standing in line before a police lieutenant <coughs> ordered him to stop or be arrested for soliciting. 
And he soon found, this, this was amazing, that the vast majority of those in line were not members, and many had never even heard of CCDL. Let me ask you something. If CCDL had 10, 20, 100 times the committed membership, might the new laws have been stopped in the tracks? That they were going to push it through no matter what, but if you guys had a hundred times the people that were committed to work the polls, to work for politicians, to fund lawsuits, to do everything that's needed to get the word out, I submit we'd have a different picture. But it's the level of detachment, apathy, and non-involvement, and it's hardly exclusive to Connecticut. Because the same story can be told by the leadership of any number of state gun rights groups where it's always a core and dedicated individual straight in barrel load that can be shared by many, but somehow it never is. That's because we got jobs and the liberals don't. Well, that's, that, that, that's true, but you know what? We, we all have jobs. I submit that everyone who belongs to the NRA has a job as well. And we're the ones out there, but look at it. Of the 80 million gun owners, something like 5 million are members of the NRA. Look at how few have joined. How many fewer support much smaller groups like Gun Owners of America and the Second Amendment Foundation or educational groups like Jews for the Preservation of Firearms Ownership. This has to change and immediately. Why? Well, what are we here for today? If a lot more gun owners don't get involved, Perhaps the bold chat room warriors that I referred to earlier will get the chance to demonstrate to their brethren here in Connecticut how much better they'll perform when it's their turn to show the stuff they're made of. Yeah! So, what is it that we do? Okay? What is it that we do? First, we join with others, like we're doing right now. Look, if you don't like one group, find one you can support. You don't like lobbying, find a group that educates. That means support them, including financially. You know, we heard about the lawsuit. Very expensive proposition. And yeah, times are tough. I understand that. Times are tough on all of us. Do what you can, but don't let others who are also strapped do it all. What else? Some of you are going to be better suited to taking people shooting, training the next generation. I don't know, what is it that you find rewarding? What is it that you're enthusiastic doing? Do that. Some of you will find your talents best expressed in writing, and there's plenty of need to get well-written letters to the editor out there to correct the foaming of the mouth bias. But enough of the Hartford current. <laughs> Actually not. I told you I, I continued to rewrite the speech, and, and so this part here, I've got to bear in and make sure my ant fryers here are focused and, and get into my handwritten scribbling and see if I can decipher the uh, ancient hieroglyphics that I call handwriting. Because by not, you know, by, by calling for arrests and prosecutions, they've removed all pretenses to being about common sense gun safety. Okay, these are the people that Diane Feinstein calls real reporters, Joe Biden calls legitimate news media. I call them fourth estate, fifth columnists. Yeah. And I understand that there, there was a cartoon and a little essay written by Bob Engelhardt. And he's got a wonderful idea. He says, repeal the Second Amendment, and that's going to solve it all. That's what this guy thinks. You know what? This guy is presuming to teach and he doesn't even belong in a remedial civics class. I'd like to read you a little something from, from the Heller decision. It's always been widely understood that the Second Amendment, like the First and Fourth Amendment, codifies a pre-existing right. The very text of the Second Amendment implicitly recognizes the pre-existing, uh, told you hieroglyphs, of the right and declares only that it shall not be infringed. And this is the Supreme Court saying, as we said in U.S. versus Trudecheck, this is not a right granted by the Constitution. Neither is it in any manner dependent on that instrument for its existence. This is our right, and this is something that the progressives don't understand. They somehow think that our unalienable rights are somehow privileges 
bestowed upon us by our masters in government. They think that's the way it's supposed to work. This, of course, is the, is the UN theory of rights as well. You can have what privileges we say until we say you can't. Wrong. And in terms of, of Bob Engelhardt, anybody see Tropic Thunder? Okay, buddy, you went full Engelhardt. You never go full Engelhardt. Okay, here's one. Here, here's another little thing. You can go, get on the social media, all right? I know a lot of you turn your noses up that and you consider it a silly waste of time. And if all you're doing is inviting people to play bubble safari and sharing trivia and stupid videos, it is. But these are also utilities for spreading important information. And I think we've seen this recently in the Ukraine, we've seen it in Venezuela, the way that people get information out there. Think in terms of our being able to use it, command, control, communications, and intelligence. Because you better believe the other side is using this and mastering it. And if you refuse to, what you're doing is you're ceding an entire area of operation to them without challenge. And what do they do once they establish a secure beachhead? They use it to launch their next and deeper assault. Don't give that to them. Make them fight for every inch. Now, some of you will actually enjoy politics. And if you're good at it, that can be a lot of fun. Thing is, we all know there's plenty of politicians who have a huge butt. Okay? As in, I support the Second Amendment butt. And then they come up with all kinds of ridiculous cop-outs and betrayals. And so I guess what I'm going to say is don't fall for charlatans. How do you know? You can come up with ways to separate the wheat from the chaff and get them to unequivocally go on the record for where they stand, what laws they consider constitutional, why, and importantly, what they'll work to get rid of, because regardless of what some of them may have told you, it's not enforce existing gun laws, it's repeal the damn things. Now, true, politicians lie, no duh, but pinning them down with specifics makes that a lot harder to get away with. But then here's the thing. Say you find a good one. We've been introduced to some good ones here today. Will you let such a politician stand alone? Because it would be a lot easier for them to play it safe if you expect them to take the difficult route and actually be leaders. You have to be ready to stand beside them and stand behind them. And this brings up another area just trying for involvement, one that's hardly glamorous or instantly gratifying, but one that's nonetheless critical if your niche is political, and that's getting involved with the precinct level. I'm over here. I will not obey. Yeah. Getting out the vote and directing party choices. A friend of mine, Dan Schultz, has put together some real good information on this. Right now, he tells me over half the precinct commitment slots are vacant in both major political parties in this country, and that cries for freedom-minded people to fill up those slots. And again, if you want to learn more about this, if you Google precinct projects and my last name, that'll get you to some links where you can learn a lot more. But now here's the thing, all this stuff I've just been talking about, it presupposes that we're living in normal times, doesn't it? And things are hardly normal in Connecticut right now. The state is trying to ram intolerable acts down your throats. And it looks like a critical mass of you are telling them that you're not going to cooperate, that you refuse to obey, and that you will not disarm. And see, that's the first step, even before fixing on what you will do, like join a group or engage in activism or participate in politics. We have to come to grips in our own minds with what our own conscience will allow us to do and not to do. And the rest of the gun owners, not just in Connecticut, but the truth is the entire country, are watching to see what happens here. And they're going to take their lead from you. From you. That's right, you. Because, let me tell you something. By virtue of the fact that you are here today and others aren't, guess what? Like it or not, you are leaders. Yeah. Would, you, would, you, would you think that it's just us guys up here at the microphone with our names on the program? Remember how I started out this talk? I'm one of you. 
And remember how I said it's personal for me and I will not obey? I didn't say we, because I can't speak for you and I can't demand that you make a terrible choice that no one has a right to force on you and maybe pay a terrible price that no one has a right to demand from you. Only you can make that call. So speaking for myself, I can stand here in front of this monolith to the state and I can let them know one simple truth. I will not obey orders for Americans to surrender their arms. I will not obey. I will not obey! If, if you'd like to join me, if, if you'd like to join me, <laughs> they'd like to join me, feel free to say it with me and let them know. I will not obey. Now, where does Governor Malloy hang out on weekends in relation to this place? No matter, I'll say it a bit louder so that he can hear, and again, those of you who want to, feel free to chime in. I will not obey. There's another guy now. There, there's another guy who needs to hear this, and that's the head hatchet man, Mike Lawler. This is the guy who said, you can either surrender the weapon to us, destroy the weapon, or sell it to a federal firearms licensee. And after January 1st, if it hasn't been declared or, or registered, it's banned, and if you get caught, you're gonna be arrested. In other words, disarm, or he will destroy you. This guy thinks that's his lot in life. Well, you know what? Mr. Lawler, I will not obey. I will not obey. And there's one final guy that I'd like to give an honorable mention to. This is the enforcer from Brantford who wanted to give up a part of his anatomy because he couldn't wait to bang down doors. We'll just call him nutty or maybe lefty. Anyway, I understand he's on leave and maybe in hiding right now, so maybe this one ought to be just a bit louder so he can hear us. I will not obey. I will not obey. I'd like to leave you with a quote from, from one of my heroes, a great American hero, Henry David Thoreau, author of Civil Disobedience. One of my favorite quotes. I was not designed to be forced. I will breathe after my own fashion. Let us see who is the strongest. God bless you people. I'm awed. Thank you.